Stanford University. Good evening. I think we'll get started. My name is Kevin O'Neill in the marketing department at Stanford Blood Center, and welcome to tonight's Cafe Scientifique. We are delighted to have a graduate of the University of Virginia, the University of Pennsylvania Medical School, and a uh, graduate of the Stanford Residency Program in Dermatology. Please give a warm welcome to Dr. Susan Sweater. Thank you, Kevin, uh, very much for the invitation, and I'm delighted to be here. I will warn you at the outset, I've had this little throat cough for the last week, maybe allergy-related. I'm not otherwise ill, so excuse me if I'm breaking to get some water. It's the inopportune time to have a little bit of mild laryngitis. So um, I'm going to talk, Kevin gave me the topic of skin cancer, best practices for its prevention and treatment. I'm really going to focus on prevention what we know about sunscreens and skin cancer. I'm happy to field questions about treatment for skin cancers, the common ones that we see, basal cell, squamous cell, and then melanoma, which um, I direct the program regarding uh, cutaneous melanoma at Stanford and the VA Palo Alto. So I have no conflicts of interest to disclose. I am going to talk about trade names of products because I find it very unhelpful if I just give you chemical names of sunscreens and don't mention what they're in. And I have absolutely no proprietary interest in any of them. So what I want to talk about tonight are some of the harmful effects of both natural and artificial ultraviolet light. I'm going to talk about how we can potentially prevent skin cancer. That's our primary prevention strategy through sun protective practices. I'll talk about various sunscreen types in terms of their efficacy in preventing sunburn, photoaging, and skin cancers. And then I want to go into some of the newer FDA regulations on sunscreen labeling and what we hope is coming down the pipeline in terms of truly effective sunscreens in the US. We're far behind other developed countries in this realm. So when we take a look at radiation from the sun, the vast majority is actually visible in infrared light. And ultraviolet radiation accounts for only about 6% of the sun's radiation reaching the Earth's surface. Of the ultraviolet light, we have UVC, which is a very low wavelength light, completely blocked by the ozone layer. It's an antimicrobial light. UVB, which is really our sunburn and skin cancer causing sun uh, ray. And we have UVA, which is a longer wave light. And it turns out that about 95% of the UV radiation hitting the Earth's surface is UVA, because it's not blocked by the ozone layer, as opposed to UVB, which largely is blocked by the ozone layer. What does UV light do to the skin? If we take a look at the normal skin layers, we have the stratum corneum, which is your top layer of skin. It, it's the one that turns over over time. This is the epidermis, the outer layer of the skin, composed of keratinocytes. Melanocytes are your pigment-producing cells, which reside at the basal layer, the bottom layer of the epidermis. And then the dermis is below that. And then we have subcutaneous fat, muscle, bone, as we move kind of south in the skin. The dermis has blood vessels, it has collagen and elastin, and that becomes important with chronic sun damage too. So what do we see with chronic sun exposure to the skin? What happens is the stratum corneum, that top layer, will become cracked and fissured. That results in a lot of dryness and skin fragility. The epidermis gets thinner. That also contributes to fragility of the skin. We can see the melanocytes uh, change in terms of their distribution and cause what people call liver spots or age spots. They're actually sun spots. They're solar lentigenes. And uh, keratinocytes can become atypical, and both the melanocytes and keratinocytes can then evolve into skin cancer. As the dermis becomes thinner, we lose collagen and elastin with chronic sun exposure. The blood vessels become more prominent, so there's a lot of easy bruising of the skin in addition to wrinkling and sagging of the skin. So I love this picture. This is just looking at a plump, very unlined skin of a baby's hand compared to a person with chronic sun damage. These are the solar lentigenes, the sun-induced freckles, and you can see the wrinkling and sagging of the skin, the prominent blood vessels as the dermis gets thinner. So I'm going to move into ultraviolet light and the two different types that are relevant for skin cancer. So ultraviolet B is a shorter wavelength of light. And it is uh, different than ultraviolet A in that we see both seasonal and daily variations. So it's about 400 times stronger in the summer than the winter. 
and it also has peak uh, intensity between 10 and 4, which is why the sun protection regulations are always, or recommendations are always to avoid those peak hours. It does penetrate the epidermis and the upper dermis, but it penetrates less deeply than UVA because UVA is a longer wavelength of light. And as I mentioned, it's absorbed by the ozone layer and, and largely blocked by window glass, uh, although some can penetrate some forms of window glass. Uh, UVB is kind of our main ultraviolet wavelength that we think of for causing sunburn. It is a sunburning ray, and it certainly contributes to skin cancer. UVB is also affected by altitude, so we see about an 8 to 10 percent increase in harmful ultraviolet B irradiation with every 1,000 feet of elevation. And there was a study done a couple of years ago that looked at ultraviolet B levels in Vail, Colorado at 8,500 feet and found that they were essentially equivalent to those in Orlando, Florida, which is so much closer, 775 miles closer to the equator. So this is something we need to caution individuals who are going to either be at altitude, skiers and hikers, or who live at altitude, that they really do need to sun protect on a regular basis. What is sunburn? I don't have to explain this to everybody. It's redness of the skin induced by the sun. But we can see severe reactions, which include uh, fever, chills, nausea, blisters, and even scarring, somewhat equivalent to a thermal burn if you were to drop something hot on your skin. In terms of a cure for sunburn, there's nothing that's easy for this. Uh, years ago, I think a lot of companies advertised products like solar cane. Has anyone heard of that? It's a topical anesthetic. And it's a very potent sensitizer of the skin, so it caused a lot of contact dermatitis. We don't usually recommend topical anesthetic agents for sunburn. What we do recommend are things like cool compresses, tub baths with Aveeno, which is an oatmeal, colloidal oatmeal soak, uh, lotions like Sarna, which have camphor and menthol in them. Uh, they can provide a lot of relief. Aspirin and non-steroidals through prostaglandin inhibition also can really prevent inflammation. So if there is a sunburn, it doesn't hurt at all to take some ibuprofen or aspirin. Topical steroids, I think they're helpful. There's been some studies done showing that systemic steroids, which are anti-inflammatory, don't really help. But uh, when my two daughters, one of whom plays water polo and is a swimmer and the other one's a soccer player, when they get sunburned, which I frown upon but am not able to prevent, I do recommend some topical steroids. And they can help reduce, again, some of the inflammation and discomfort. So UVA, excuse me, has a longer wavelength of light extending all the way to 400 nanometers in its wavelength, there are two types of UVA, a near UVA and a far UVA. Um, it is, again, strong all day and all year long. And because it's a more deeply penetrating ray, we see this as more of a photoaging ray. It's getting into the dermis and affecting that collagen and the elastin. It also, though, contributes to skin cancer. And part of the reason we know this is that tanning beds emit mostly UVA. They emit UVB and UVA. But we've seen such incredible spikes in skin cancer incidents with tanning bed usage, and I'll get into that a little bit more, that we know that UVA really contributes to skin cancer formation. It is also very relevant for individuals who have photosensitive conditions, meaning if they go out in the sun and they're on a certain medication, like a high blood pressure medicine or an antibiotic for acne like doxycycline, they could get a rash from the sun. And so UVA is responsible for that. And there are individuals who have uh, certain conditions like lupus, where they're sensitive to the sun. That's UVA driven. So UVA has become increasingly important as we understand its contribution to a lot of uh, sun-related conditions, including skin cancer. So I've talked about what the sun does, and I'm going to focus a little bit now on skin cancer itself. So one in five Americans will develop skin cancer, and I would say at least. And the reason for this is we don't keep National Cancer Institute, what are called SEER statistics, uh, for the non-melanoma skin cancer types, basal cell carcinoma and squamous cell carcinoma, and those are by far the most common types of skin cancer we see. These estimates of skin cancer incidence for basal cell and squamous cell came from a Medicare reporting database in 2006, and there were at least 3 million cases of basal cell uh, per year in this analysis and over 500,000 cases of squamous cell, but the numbers are probably much greater. Melanoma is a reportable cancer. It's also the most lethal skin cancer we see. And this year, there'll be over 76,000 cases of invasive melanoma. Those are tumors that have the potential to spread and, and cause death. And then there'll be many cases also of melanoma in situ, which is the earliest type of melanoma we see and is completely cured when we remove it surgically or with other methods. 
In terms of the non-melanoma skin cancers, the basal cell and squamous cell types, again, are the most common human cancers worldwide. They tend to have very low metastatic rates and have problems on the skin locally. The exception to the metastasis occurs, though, in the setting of squamous cell carcinoma in organ transplant patients because their immune systems are reduced, they're immunosuppressed so that they can tolerate the transplant, uh, transplanted organ, and over time, their risk for squamous cell carcinoma goes way up, particularly longer duration of transplant, higher immunosuppressives used, and so on. And so we have to really uh, monitor these patients very closely because they are immunosuppressed, their tumors tend to do worse. It's also important to note that even though the squamous cell and basal cell carcinomas are rarely fatal, they do cause a lot of morbidity for patients, downtime, uh, surgery, surgery, cosmetic impairment, functional impairment if it's located over a joint or whatnot, and the healthcare costs are significant, so we're doing a lot to try to prevent these cancers too. And then as I mentioned, melanoma is the most deadly skin cancer, and so obviously we want to detect this early when it's most curable. So what have we seen in young women likely related to tanning beds? Over the last 30 years or 40 years, there's actually been a more than doubling of both non-melanoma and melanoma skin cancers in young women under the age of 40. We've not seen this occur to the same degree in young men. And so we have to take a look at why this is occurring from the 1990s onward, and we call it a birth cohort effect. Basically, we're seeing this in women that are born after the year 1965. In that relatively short period of time, we don't anticipate that host factors or genetic factors are going to change in a population, so we have to look at potential environmental factors. And really, the only thing that really is, is contributory in terms of an, a new environmental risk factor would be tanning beds, because they became prevalent in the 1980s, and they were marketed as a safe alternative uh, to natural sunlight, which they are not. And just to show you this graphically, this is looking at the SEER data, and this, uh, this is the surveillance and um, epidemiology and end results that's from the National Cancer Institute for, for Cancer Reporting. And this is melanoma in women uh, under the age of 39, 20 to 39. And you can see these time frames, 83 to 87, 93 to 97, 2003 to 2007, across each age increment here and each time period, the incidence of melanoma has increased dramatically. I just want to mention this slide, and it's, it helped a lot in terms of now what we're seeing in terms of tanning lead, uh, red legislation in the U.S. to restrict access to minors. In 2010, there were four studies that, that were, uh, were published worldwide in the U.S. out of a Minnesota case control study, Australia, Scandinavia, and Iceland, that really worked to solidify the link between indoor tanning and melanoma incidence. And uh, in the Minnesota study, for instance, it was shown that if you had ever used a tanning bed, your risk of melanoma was 75% higher than an individual who had never used one. Uh, and each indoor tanning session itself is believed to increase the risk of melanoma about 1.8%. And because tanning bed users often use tanning beds at least once a month, sometimes four or five times a month, and for years on end, particularly in that population of, of individuals age 15 to 25, you can imagine what this is doing to melanoma risk over time. A colleague of mine who uh, is a dermatoepidemiologist at, at uh, Brown University in the VA Providence has called this tanning project an experiment on millions over the last 30 years, and now we're seeing the impacts. And so fortunately, we have a couple of states now that are working to restrict access to minors tanning bed operators and the tanning industry in general markets and promotes the use of these uh, tanning, indoor tanning to um, young women and adolescents, and so restricting those behaviors um, to individuals under the 18 is critical. Right now, only 39 states have youth access restrictions, and California was the first in the nation in 2010 to restrict access to minors, followed by Vermont, and then last year, Oregon, Nevada, Texas, and Illinois, and then most recently, just this year, Minnesota and Louisiana. 18 other states have some type of tanning bed legislation that they're hoping to, again, um, equate to this in terms of reducing access to minors. So I think we're getting there, but there's a long way to go, and the tanning lobby really fights this. So who's at risk for skin cancer? It seems pretty intuitive. Individuals with fair skin, we call it the skin phenotype one and two, are at the greatest risk. And how we classify skin type is, is according to how much melanin or pigment your skin has, in addition to how your skin reacts to the sun. Does it tan or does it burn? So when we look at skin types, there are six, with type one being a Celtic background person, red hair, blue-green eyes, lots of freckles. Uh, type 
uh, two and three skin being more average Caucasian skin, most people with a type two where they sort of burn easily and then tan minimally, although there are uh, white individuals with a more moderate burning and tanning. Uh, beige, lightly tan skin, type four and five, thinking more of Latino and Hispanic skin and light African American skin, dark brown or black skin in, in African Americans, and uh, really at much lower risk for sun-related skin cancers. So sun-sensitive phenotypes, just a picture of a redhead uh, here, and I, I think what's alarming um, in some mouse models that have been uh, uh, studied at Harvard, it's been shown that red pigment, which is called pheomelanin, it's one of the two types of pigment that is made in the melanin family, itself is a risk factor for melanoma, at least in mice, regardless of whether they're exposed to the sun. So we really need to target individuals with this type one skin for skin cancer prevention um, methods. Now what we're seeing more, particularly in a state as ethnically diverse as California, are, are a lot of skin cancers in darker skinned individuals. So skin individuals with that, that phototype four, five, and six. Individuals are, they are at much lower risk for some of the sun-induced melanomas, but definitely are getting more melanomas, basal cells, and squamous cells over time. So this is something that's also important in our prevention messages. The skin cancers themselves, I'm gonna show you some pictures and just talk about them. Basal cell, again, is the most common type, and most of these are found on the head and the neck. And to show you some pictures, these are sort of pearly looking, often glistening on the skin. They often have blood vessels you can see running through them. Um, they're a little bit soft, so if this is on a male's cheek and he's shaving his cheek, they tend to bleed a lot. So bleeding, friable lesion, uh, that tends to be the basal cell. And again, these have a very low rate of metastasis, but they can be incredibly locally invasive if they're not treated early enough. It, uh, it locally invasive on the skin, so it causes a lot of destruction of the skin. And we treat them with surgery. I, again, I wasn't gonna focus on treatment. We have lots of ways we can treat them. When they're early and superficial, we can use topical agents. Um, one of them is called uh, uh, bifluorouracil. We can use a miquimod. There are other things that are FDA approved for that. And then um, most of them are treated with surgery, and then there's a specialized surgery we do called Mohs micrographic surgery that can really ensure that the margins are clear um, as the surgeon is operating. The squamous cell carcinoma, as I mentioned, we have to pay a lot of attention to in immunosuppressed patients, but the squamous cell carcinoma is also the second most common cause of skin cancer metastasis and death. So every year there are about 1,500 deaths from skin squamous cell carcinoma that metastasized. And so that's something we have to be on the lookout for. And in fact, we were meeting with our head and neck colleagues today at the VA to talk about high-risk squamous cell carcinomas in the head and neck because we see them when they're earlier, the, the oncologists see them when they metastasize to lymph nodes. So we really want to work at, again, um, monitoring patients more closely. Yes? You know, there are multiple published rates, so there are multiple studies and populations that are looked at. Yeah, but that's usually there's a range and a rate, so it, so it depends on multiple studies that are looked at. So some of this could include a transplant population where the rate is higher. Some of this could include a population that is not immunosuppressed where the rate is lower. So often we'll see a range in the rates. Actinic keratoses are considered a precancer, and it's actually a bit of a misnomer. In reality, less than one in a thousand of these will turn into a squamous cell skin cancer. And these are what you might have already or noticed or have been treated for, the rough, kind of gritty, sandpapery feeling bumps on the skin in chronically sun-exposed sites. Uh, and they can transform to skin cancer, to the squamous cell skin cancer type. Uh -huh. But they're most um, important to just recognize as a marker of increased um, sun damage and skin cancer risk. I'm just going to move this higher. Sorry. So again, these are we treat these with liquid nitrogen cryotherapy. I'm, I'm imagining a number of individuals in the room are familiar with that. We can use topical agents as well and what we call field treatment, again, with those agents like 5-fluorouracil and miquimod. Uh, a new therapy called photodynamic therapy. And so these are um, very easy to treat early, and, and I think we're really thinking about treating uh, the field effect, the field treatment to prevent skin cancer as well as, as go after the actinic keratoses. The squamous cell carcinomas are a little more firm than the basal cells. They often have an eroded or crusted center. They tend to be red. They can bleed easily. And the bottom line is if you were to notice any kind of non-healing sore in a chronically sun-exposed site in particular, you'd want to have that looked at by your doctor or dermatologist. So melanoma accounts for only 4% of all skin cancers, but over 75% of skin cancer deaths. And that equates to about 
one person dying every hour in the U.S. in terms of the numbers we see, which is close to 10,000 individuals who would die from melanoma this year. Almost two-thirds of the deaths we see are in men compared to women. Um, we've done a lot of research at Stanford and my group looking at whether this is due to behavior or biology. Um, men are, are less apt to participate in cancer screening, cancer prevention messaging, and early detection strategies than women. But we also have published some data in the last year that showed even in young men where the, where the behaviors may not be as relevant because young women don't get as much screening either, men were about 55% more likely to die of melanoma than young women. And so we match this according to lots of the factors that are relevant, the thickness of the tumor, the stage, the location, the subtype, and whether there was metastasis or not. And so we do think there may be a biologic issue at play, whether it's a, a, an estrogen or androgen effect uh, or, or immune differences in men and women, but something we're looking at. The key, though, is in both sexes that early detection is the key to survival. So when we pick up melanomas that are thin, they're far more likely to be curable than ones that are thicker on the skin. And gram for gram, melanoma is the most deadly skin cancer. So if we take a look at a melanoma that's a millimeter, the breadth of your a hair, the survival tends to be over 93% at five years. If that melanoma is over four millimeters, the survival rate drops to 50% or so. So it's a, just a minute fractions of the, the thickness of the tumor and other factors that can make a big difference in terms of survival. The risk factors for melanoma would include older age, fair skin. We think that probably most individuals over the age of 50 warrant a skin examination. However, this is not recommended by the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force, which really tries to um, decide what's the most useful uh, an efficient way for primary care providers to parse out their time. And so there was some data coming out of Germany, um, and we're actually looking at the VA, and a colleague of mine is looking at, at Pittsburgh to try to really show that skin cancer screening can reduce melanoma mortality and morbidity from other skin cancers, and that that should be incorporated as part of the primary care examination. There aren't enough dermatologists to see everybody, and so we really want to target patients with strong family history of melanoma, because there is a hereditary component. It's not common, but that would be a risk factor. Fair skin, lots of sun exposure. Other precancers, those, those um, actinic keratoses, basal cell and squamous cell carcinoma, that puts you at risk for melanoma because it's indicative of your sun exposure. Um, patients with um, a lot of sunburn history, um, lots of moles on the skin, atypical moles, which is another phenotype of moles that we see. And then most importantly, if a patient notices a changing lesion, whether it's brown or not, something that looks different than the rest. And so I've kind of gone over some of the warning signs here. So a lesion that doesn't match, the borders don't match each other. They're, I'm sorry, the borders are notched or irregular, or it's asymmetric where one half doesn't match the other, where the colors are different, or whether it's larger than a pencil eraser, which is about six millimeters. Most of the melanomas we see are brown, but some are not. And I'll show you some pictures of these. The ABCD criteria were formed in about the 1980s. And then the, as the E was added because there's a subtype of melanoma that doesn't tend to exhibit these, but it changes over time and it's evolving. In Europe, the, the um, public health message is to focus on the ugly duckling sign, the lesion that doesn't match the other. It doesn't fit the family of moles or the other freckles that a patient makes. And I think it's a really helpful and easy thing for patients to remember, so I use that quite a bit. So just showing you some of the pictures here, this is the most common type of melanoma we see, superficial spreading melanoma. It tends to exhibit those A, B, C, D warning signs, asymmetry, border irregularity. You can have color variegation where you see shades of brown and black, red and white within it. Uh, and then it tends to be larger, although certainly in, in my field we pick these up when they're much smaller than a pencil eraser. Lentigo malignant melanoma is uh, an increasing subtype we're seeing in older individuals. It's a little bit more linked to cumulative sun damage, so we see it in chronically sun-exposed sites on the head, neck, and arms in older, fair skin individuals. It's the most common melanoma we see in our veteran population here at the VA Palo Alto. The acral antigenous melanoma is the most common subtype of melanoma we see in darker-skinned individuals. And it's not that darker skin individuals are at higher risk of this type of melanoma compared to other melanomas. It's just that they're at lower risk of sun-related melanomas. Excuse me. Where, where exactly is the uh, melanoma on the right? So the melanoma is moving up here into the fingernail. 
Uh huh. So there's, it arises, the aqual melanoma, aqual means palms and soles. So the most common place we actually see it is the soles. But it can also occur in the finger and toenails, and it arises from the melanocytes that are present here in the nail matrix, and often presents with a streak in the nail. No, these are not sun related. These are not, it's not a sun related melanoma, and we have no idea how to prevent it. So we've got to pick it up early. There's, pardon me? Well, not, you know, melanoma, a certain percentage is related to sun and a certain is not. So cells go bad through various genetic mechanisms, and we don't know what the driver is for that. But not all melanomas are ultraviolet related. Yeah. So nodular melanoma, I want to mention, nodular melanoma is a tough one. This is only about 10 to 15 percent of the melanomas we see, but it accounts for over 50 percent of the deeper melanomas that we pick up. It tends to grow rapidly over a couple of months, whereas these other subtypes grow over months to years or weeks to, you know, months to weeks to months. This is much faster. I'm sorry. So the nodular subtype, I like to say, has a Band-Aid sign. This is one of my patients who came in. It tends to elevate, grow upward, and bleed more than it has asymmetry, color variegation, or border irregularity. And it's often pink. It's often not brown. And so this one can look like a bug bite. It can look like an acne pimple. And so we've tried to add to the A, B, C, D, E, the EGF being elevated, firm, or growing rapidly for over a month. Um, usually ulcerating through the skin, so when you, when you go back, to think of the picture of the epidermis. A lot of people will equate a cancer to outgrowing the blood supply and then it sort of moves up and proliferates through the epidermis. Enough proliferation and, and mitoses and things will tend to cause ulceration of a cancer and the tumor cells become more um, undifferentiated. So it, that it pushes through the skin and that, that can, you know, it's just sort of the larger size, the more expansile that it becomes as well. Okay. The question is whether this looks like a person who might have yellowing of the fingers from smoking. So there are a lot of harmless pigmented bands in the skin, and these can also be seen in darker skinned individuals as a normal racial ethnic variant. Um, there are drugs that produce bands in the skin. Smokers have uniform yellowing. So what we really talk about is recognizing a single nail that has a, a streak through it. These are not uncommon in kids, not the melanomas, but streaking in the nails, a nevus in the nail is not uncommon. So we really need to biopsy it or to use our other tools to help differentiate it from melanoma in the nail. I'm going to move on to primary prevention efforts. Um, and this is where we are trying to prevent skin cancer and, other mel and, and melanoma from developing. The reason is that 65% of melanomas in white populations worldwide are attributable to sun exposure, which means that some melanomas are not. So we do see melanomas in the eyes, we see them in the mouth, we see them in the genital area, on the palms and soles, so these are not always related to sun exposure. Most of the sun exposure that one that an individual um, uh, receives is actually in earlier childhood and adulthood, and early adulthood, and so that's why we're focusing a lot of the primary prevention uh, on younger individuals, because when you think about it, once you are finished with college, you go work, you may be inside most of the time, and you're not nearly as out outside as much. Um, we know also that a lot of sun exposure in early years of life increases the number of moles that you get as an adult, and that's an independent risk factor for melanoma. So can we prevent melanoma? Well, for the very first time uh, in 2010, an Australian study suggested that we can prevent melanoma with regular sunscreen use. And I'll just go into this a little bit. I know it's a busy slide. What was the excess count? Nevis. Nevis is mole. Ne I'm sorry, nevis is mole. So mole count. Um, this is a randomized controlled trial, which is critical because what it means is that half the population got the intervention and half did not, and it was over 1,600 adults, so age 25 to 75, half of whom used just an SPF 16 sunscreen to the head and arms only every day for a period of 4.5 years versus individuals who discretionarily or optionally used it or didn't use it at all. You can see this early time period that this was done. So the sunscreens aren't even as good back here, uh, back in this era as now. 10 years after the intervention, there were 50% fewer melanomas in the group of individuals who had used sunscreen daily. And interestingly, this was true for sites outside of where they applied the sunscreen, which suggests that they probably applied it elsewhere once they were using it on their head and neck. 
Uh, there was an even greater reduction for the invasive, more deadly melanomas of about 73%. And so this was very encouraging, the very first study to say that sunscreens themselves could make a difference in melanoma prevention. And what's critical is that we have newer, much better sunscreens, and if we target not just 25-year-olds, but children and adolescents, we could see potentially greater benefits. Because the incidence and prevalence of melanoma is so high in Australia, we can actually see a much greater effect over time. So the higher a cancer amount you have and you're trying to intervene and see if it makes a difference, it makes sense to look at that population, whether they have a higher risk of getting it, which they do, because you have a predominance of fair skin individuals living closer to the equator and also the issues of the ozone thinning and the polar caps, which makes a difference in southern Australia. But it's a good point. But that is the right population to study to actually observe an effect over time. Otherwise, you'd have to look and wait 50 years if you didn't have enough melanomas in the group. Let me talk about vitamin D. Um, vitamin D uh, has gotten a lot of press from the tanning industry, which is promoting that individuals go and sit in that tanning bed to get their adequate vitamin D. So where do you get vitamin D? You get it from your diet, you get it from supplements, and you get it from the photoconversion of ultraviolet B light into its active metabolite, the 125-hydroxy vitamin D, which is also called vitamin D3. Well, the issue is that that photoconversion process depends on a number of factors. It depends on your skin type. The darker your skin, the less efficient the photoconversion. You actually need much more sunlight if you have dark skin to get that same amount of photoconversion as a fair skin. It depends on your age. Older individuals are less efficient at the photoconversion. It depends on uh, the intensity of the sun. So you're going to have more in sunny climates, more at different times of the year, because it's UVB driven, not UVA driven. And so what we're seeing is that um, the tanning bed industry and so on is, is targeting fair skin individuals to go get a tan. And it doesn't make any sense, you know, sorry, to go get, get a tan to, to get their adequate vitamin T. And in reality, individuals with fair skin are very efficient at the conversion of vitamin D, particularly younger individuals who are the ones being targeted for tanning bed use. And in fact, the incident light that you get walking to your, and from your car, grocery shopping, et cetera, is probably enough. Five to 10 minutes of sunlight a day in the summer sun is probably enough for adequate vitamin D levels in a fair skinned person. A darker skinned person might, that may not be the same um, truth. So what about vitamin D? Well, vitamin D has had some beneficial effects on incidence and mortality of several cancers, including colorectal, prostate, non-Hodgkin's breast, and potentially melanoma. And these are studies that have been done, say, in the field of melanoma, where we'll look at vitamin D levels, serum and vitamin D levels in patients with metastatic melanoma, and they'll say, well, the person with the higher vitamin D levels had a better outcome than not. But that's not exactly a pure way to look at this, and we really don't know the vitamin D role in melanoma development, protection, and survival. So at this point, we're not recommending that individuals increase their sun exposure to get adequate vitamin D levels. It is far easier to supplement with vitamin D over-the-counter, vitamin D3, um, and it's definitely safer than ultraviolet radiation to do so. Uh, over-the-counter, we, we recommend that, that individuals take about 1,000 to 2,000 international units a day if they are aggressively sun protecting, because aggressive sun protection can reduce your vitamin D levels. Now, in truth, because consumers put on so little sunscreen, they put on about a half of what they actually need to get the SPF, that the sunscreen alone is not affecting vitamin D levels as much as sun protective behaviors. We showed this in a Stanford study. So individuals who seek the shade, who are under the umbrella, who have the clothing on, who are really careful about the sun, and this is my melanoma population, they can have lower vitamin D levels. So we tell them to just take an extra 1,000 to 2,000 international units a day. The maximum dose that the Institute of Medicine, which gives kind of, I think everyone knows what that is, you know, more regulations on, on maximum, minimum dosing, what's safe, says 4,000 international units a day is fine. People who are truly vitamin D deficient may be placed on a much higher supplement by their doctor for a while and then put on the lower dose over time. So what is tanning? Tanning is your skin's way of protecting itself against sunburn. The Tanning in itself is equivalent to DNA damage, so it's not safe for your skin. It doesn't prevent skin cancer. It doesn't prevent photoaging. It does give you a little bit of an SPF, a sun protection factor of about four. So again, it helps prevent a little bit of burning, but it's damaging in itself. The only types of tanning that are actually safe are the sunless or artificial tanners or bronzers. And if anyone remembers QT tanning, okay, I remember QT because I was 
growing up in the 70s, um, it turned your skin orange. It had a, a chemical called dihydroxyacetone, which was brand new then. And now it's, it's far more elegant. Um, it, it's been uh, formulated so that it can be used gradually. It tends to match skin tones. It comes in different in skin tone types. And it, what it does is it just stains that stratum cornea in the top layer of the skin. And it lasts about three to five days. It can be continued to apply. But it's, it's a very safe way to get a little color to the skin. It doesn't protect you from sunburn. And most of the, um, the DHA products don't even have sunscreen in them because they're really not meant to be a sunscreen. So you have to use sunscreen with it. So what I'm going to emphasize, though, is that there's really no safe tan by artificial or natural ultraviolet light. I've mentioned the issue of tanning beds and skin cancer and just wanted to focus on this, that the UVA is four times stronger than natural sunlight, UVB two times stronger. This was natural sunlight, midday sun in Washington, D.C. in the summer, so pretty good comparison. And a lot of us will tell patients that a day, or sorry, a half an hour in a tanning bed is equivalent to about a day of baking at the beach. It's just bad news. Um, so we really have to emphasize this in younger individuals. So can you prevent sun damage and photoaging? And that's really going to bring into the question of, of how effective sunscreens are. So sunscreens work by either absorbing or reflecting the harmful UV rays. And we have to look at what, they, what this really means. And I think most people know what the sun protection factor is. But it, it really works to prevent sunburn. Sun protection factor is a UVB issue. It has nothing to do with UVA. That's what it's tested for. And this is the amount of UVB exposure necessary to redden or sunburn your skin with the sunscreen compared to without. So that equates to the time. You can, if SPF is 10, you can spend 10 times longer in the sun before your skin sunburns with the sunscreen compared to without. Uh, the question, though, is whether these higher SPFs are actually um, that useful. And I'll talk about why the SPF uh, 50 plus is now what's proposed by the FDA in terms of a maximum cap. In terms of the FDA labeling, right now a broad spectrum sunscreen is going to have to be at least an SPF of 15, and it will have this label reduce the risk, to reduce the risk of skin cancer and skin early aging if used as directed with other sun protective measures. So again, we don't recommend sunscreen alone. We usually recommend other adjunctive measures, hats, protective eyewear, and clothing. So the FDA uh, in 1999 published a monograph on the sunscreens, and this is a good thing. What it did is require the sunscreen agencies and companies to have their products tested in photochemical and photobiology labs to confirm that what they're putting out there on their label in terms of the SPF is validated by the testing. Um, they revised these, the monograph in 2007, and then basically over the last seven years have been implementing these recommendations very, very slowly. One of the issues that's come up is whether the sunscreens, again, should be capped at 30 or 50. And the reason for this is if a sunscreen is properly applied, 93% is blocked by an SPF of 15, 96 by an SPF of 30, 98 by an SPF of 50. So this isn't that great. But the problem we see is that consumers don't put on enough. Most studies have shown they put on about a third to a half of what they need. And the amount that you have to put on to get what you need is so high. In fact, the newest recommendations have said it's a teaspoon to the face, head, and neck, a teaspoon to each arm, two teaspoons to each legs, and two to each leg, and two to three teaspoons to the trunk. So that's probably half a bottle of a six-ounce sunscreen. And I don't know about you, but even my sunscreens last me about a month, unless I'm you know on a vacation or something. So that's the problem: is consumers aren't getting the sunscreen, the SPF that's in the bottle. Um, and so for that reason, there's a consideration of capping at 50. In addition, individuals who have those photosensitive disorders, um, like I talked about lupus, or so they're on medications, we see a bunch of these issues in our dermatology clinic, might benefit from an SPF 100. It gives them that much longer in the sun before they burn. So it, there's a question of whether it's going to be capped, but if it, will, if it is, it'll be fi labeled as 50 plus. The other thing the FDA has really weighed in on is the need for broad spectrum sunscreen. Again, it has to protect against both UVB and UVA. Let me go back here. Um, and what the FDA has decided, that UVB protection is pretty good. It's pretty well vetted. It's been around for years. But what isn't is the UVA. And so there are a number of ways that UVA protection is measured. They had a photo protection factor. They had equivalent to the SPF, not equivalent, but a way of looking at it. They had a four or five star rating. And what they've now decided is that the sunscreens have to pass the critical wavelength of over 370 nanometers to be labeled broad spectrum. 
Uh, the problem is, if you'll recall, that UVA goes all the way to 400 nanometers. So we're still not getting into that far UVA. We do see some increase in the UVA protection as the SPF, the UVB protection, goes up. And that's kind of what's helped us over time. In terms of sunscreen types, we have chemical sunscreens and we have physical sunscreens. And, and we call the chemical sunscreens organic, which seems counterintuitive, but you have to think about organic chemistry. The physical sunscreens are inorganic. They're made from inert substances. These chemical sunscreens have been around for a long time. And again, most of these have worked quite well to filter out UVB, less so UVA, at least in the United States. Um, the initial filter that was used was PABA amino benzoic acid, PABA, and it actually, or para amino benzoic acid, sorry, and it caused a lot of photosensitization, so patients got a rash with it. It was taken off the market in the late 60s or early 70s. Benzophenones, or oxybenzone, is the main ingredient we see in most UVB sunscreens, which all sunscreens have UVB, but it's the one that's used the most, and we can also see some others. The triazines are, are superior. They're in Europe and not in the U.S. at this point, and I'll talk a little bit about the frustrations we have with U.S. sunscreens compared to those in Europe, Australia, and in other countries. Benzophenones, uh, this, but this oxybenzone was just named the contact allergen of the year by the American Contact Dermatitis Society. So that tends to be the main problem we see with it. Although it's been around since the 1970s, it's been very safe otherwise. UVA filters uh, use the benzophenones a little bit. They go into the UVA range. And then the dibenzoyl methanes, and the prototype for that's avabenzone. Physical sunscreens reflect and scatter UV light. But it's important to know these used to be called sunblocks. All sunscreens, though, will allow some ultraviolet light to penetrate the skin about 2% of UVB and up to 60% of UVA. So there's no such thing as a sunblock. And the FDA has actually removed the word sunblock from labeling. Everything's a sunscreen. The physical sunscreens, though, are zinc oxide. That's the prototype. So you think of this as opaque. It's in desiccant and diaper cream. Nothing gets through it. But that's cosmetically unacceptable. And so micronized forms of, of zinc oxide and titanium dioxide, which are much less opaque, have been developed. Now, these are considerably approved, and I said they're cosmetically accepted. The problem, though, with the micronized titanium dioxide and zinc oxide is that they don't go all the way into that UVA range on their own. So you can see this is probably the maximum they're going to hit 290 to 380 nanometers. And by themselves, they actually have a pretty poor UVB blockage, only about an SPF of 5.6. So these need to be combined with organic filters. You can buy physical sun blockers on their own. Solbar makes them. It's zinc and or uh, titanium dioxide. Sometimes it's both, or it's one or the other. But by themselves, they're not great photoprotection agents. So they often add a UV filter, a chemical called octanoxate, which increases the SPF. But octanoxate can deactivate other important UV filters. So this gets a little confusing. This is a, drug, a sunscreen optazole that we had hoped would be um, on the market by now. This, I think I've used this on a slide for at least eight years. And it's supposed to have coated the titanium dioxide with manganese to make it go into the far UVA spectrum. But I haven't seen anything on this sunscreen ingredient. And I'm hoping it's at least being studied in Europe. It may be very reasonable to use these physical sunscreens, though, in individuals who have a sensitization to the chemical agents, and also uh, in children under the age of two. So we try to avoid pediatric sun exposure in the first six months of life. We try not to have babies out in the sun. They should be protected in shade, not in the hot sun. Between the ages of six months and two years, though, because children's skin can have a little bit more absorption of, of materials on it, we would often will say that the, that the inorganic, that these inert physical sunscreens are very safe to use. But um, it's also not disproven that we have to use them over the, um, I'm sorry, we can, we can use the chemical ones as well. So what is broad spectrum sunscreen? Well, broad spectrum sunscreen at this point in the US largely involves the chemical sunscreens, the organic sunscreens. And the sunscreens at this point in the US contain avabenzone. It used to be called Parcel 1789. This is a long wave UVA filter. But the problem is it's called photolabile. It breaks down in the sun after 20 to 30 minutes. So it has to have a photostabilizer added. And in the US, all avabenzone-containing sunscreens have an agent called octocrylene that's added to it. This only happened in 2009, though. So that gives it a little bit more time in the sun. It lasts about two hours now. It wanes over time still. 
Um, the problem and the big frustration that we have in the dermatologic community is that there are far superior UVA filters that go across the entire UV spectrum into that far UVA range that have been developed and approved in the European Union, Japan, Israel, Australia, Canada over the last, this is, shouldn't say five to 10 years, it's after the last 10 to 15 years. And in these other countries, there are 27 available UV filters that can be incorporated into the sunscreens. In the US, we have only 17. So since the FDA uh, came out with the 1999 monograph on sunscreen, eight UV filters were submitted for review under what's called a time and extent application, where rather than repeat the worldwide studies done on the safety of these agents, the FDA can rely on the safety from other countries' data that has been years in the making. And so this was supposed to result in a rapid approval of these agents in US sunscreens over 90 to 180 days. Eight years later, we still have very little in the way of what's been approved. And so it's frustrating. There's only been four UVA filters um, approved, and, and they're, they're not uh, necessarily that useful. So Mexeril is one of those. Mexeril is a UVA filter. It's uh, trade, uh, the, the chemical is called a Camsol. It's only sold in one sunscreen brand in the US, and it's called Anthelios. And it does not go into the far UVA. It blocks near UVA one, but not far. It's photostable compared to avabenzone, but it still isn't getting all the way to that 400 nanometer range. And what frustrates me is that in the US, Anthelios costs over $40 at the drugstore. If you've seen it, they often give it its own little section, which I think is absurd, because to increase consumer use, these have to be affordable. So the very best sunscreens contain what's called Tinazorb M and Tinazorb S. And this is what I tell my patients to get, um, particularly if they're traveling and they're gonna be out in the sun for a long time. These are at uh, the FDA stage of approval right now, and the FDA is going to weigh in on these UV filters hopefully this month, finally. And um, Tinazorb M and Tinazorb F have two chemicals. One is, um, I can never pronounce these well, uh, bimotrizinol and, and bicostrizol. And they are far UVA ranging organic filters. They don't break down in the sun. They have no safety concerns. So even the environmental working group, which comes down on sunscreens for safety, has no qualms about the Tinazorb products. Uh, when I patient, my patients travel, I say buy sunscreen there. You're going to get better sunscreen in Europe and other countries. That it's a, you know, the U.S. has for a developed country has probably the worst sunscreen agents around. So hopefully, again, this change will happen shortly because of the Sunscreen Initiative Act and Congress and others have been lobbying. Let's make the decision already. Review the sunscreens on this time and extent application, the TEA uh, uh, process, so that we can get them in the US products. Helioplex is also um, a, a little bit of a UVA filter. It's somewhat equivalent to Mexeril. All of the agents that have the Helioplex and Mexeril in the US still have avabenzone and octocrylene. So it's unclear to me whether they add a lot. They probably add a little bit. But Neutrogena, I think, has done a great job. They have made this available in every formulation possible for people who have skin that breaks out. They've made it in sprays and foams and, and lotions, and, and it comes in you know beach defense one that stays on a little bit more in the water. And um, it's cheap. It's at Costco. And so I think I, that's his, a, a go-to product for me. But Copper Tone, Banana Boat, all of these work. They all have the same products as of 2009. So you're not getting that much more or any more if you go to the cosmetic counter and buy sunscreen for 30 or $40 a bottle. You can buy this very cheaply. So what about sunscreen safety? I mentioned the Environmental Working Group, and they brought up some concerns which have largely been refuted by the FDA and in scientific testing. So the Environmental Working Group is looking at models, rat and mouse models or cell cultures where animals have received thousands of times greater exposure than we see in real life in humans. So these are injected or ingested where they might see developmental delay or carcinogenic cancer. So that really doesn't apply to how we use sunscreens in humans. And the reason is that the skin is such an effective barrier. Very little gets through that top layer of the skin, the epidermis, into the dermis where the blood vessels and lymph channels are. And that's why most of the cosmetic claims are absolute hogwash because putting things on your skin to make it look younger and get rid of this often just doesn't do anything. It just moisturizes the top layer. So the agents that the Environmental Working Group has um, talked about are oxybenzone, and they worry about endocrine disruption, estrogenic activity, meaning increased estrogens. Um, but this was shown in a Japanese fish model. They did, um, which I think is not relevant to humans. So they did um, do a study looking at this in um, 
one of the Scandinavian countries and found that with excessive use of this, there can be excretion of, of the uh, increased estrogens in the urine, I think, in men, but it had absolutely no import. It had no, no um, adverse effects. Retinal palmitate, the EWG has talked about in terms of free radical formation and skin cancer development. Well, retinal palmitate is a derivative of vitamin A, and you might be familiar with the topical retinoids or retinol, which is the over-counter, over-the-counter agent. We actually use those systemic retinoids to prevent skin cancer in transplant patients. And, and they have photoaging and all sorts of other properties. So that's soundly refuted in terms of producing skin cancer. Parabens, the um, EWG was worried about breast cancer. Parabens are available in over, or present. They're just a stabilizer. They're available or present in over 90% of cosmetic products with no uh, adverse events reported and uh, expected. And then the other thing the EWG talked about was the nanoparticles that you see in those micronized formulations of zinc oxide and titanium dioxide. And in truth, they really don't get through intact skin. So if you put them on an open wound, which I wouldn't recommend. Maybe some of the nanoparticles of sunscreen are getting through, but these are inert substances, and so, again, probably no effect. So the FDA has not questioned the safety of any ingredients in U.S. marketed sunscreens and believes that the benefits far outweigh the risks. There's very little controversy that sunscreens are safe and effective against protecting, uh, protecting against sunburn and that they can reduce the incidence of those actinic keratoses, precancers, as well as squamous cell carcinoma. We now have evidence to show, again, that they can reduce melanoma risk in that large Australian study. But we do recommend that individuals don't just rely on sunscreen and are careful about avoiding the sun in the midday peak hours, using protective hats, clothing, and eyewear. And I would just mention for eyewear, an uh, interesting concept is, you know, a lot of the uh, glasses will say they're polarized and they prevent UVB, but there's apparently a new plastic polymer called Trivex, T-R-I-V-E-X, that's supposed to be superior in blocking UV rays. And we can see cataract formation. There are melanomas in the retina and in the conjunctiva that may be more sun-related. So um, we do think that protective eyewear is important. So water resistance, there's no such thing as waterproof sunburn, I, uh, waterproof sunscreen, I think I told you. And, and now we're going to be able to call these water resistant or very water resistant. That marketing and labeling has already occurred. If it's water resistant, it means that it maintains its SPF after 40 minutes of water immersion. And very water resistant maintains it after 80 minutes of water immersion. So sunscreens do wash off if you're going to be swimming for a long period of time. We usually recommend that a person towel dry and, and try to put them on dry skin then thereafter. So what's the ideal sunscreen and how to use it? Um, I would say a Tynosorb containing product right now or the other UV filters that are being developed and have already been developed in other countries. But you want one that's photostable, non-greasy, easy to apply, non-irritating, provides a thick layer of coverage, broad spectrum, water resistant depending on your activity. Um, SPF, we're saying, you know, I, I like to recommend at least a 30 because consumers don't put on enough. So even though the rating of over 15 will be what's on the bottles or is already to prevent skin cancer and photoaging, again, we just don't put on enough. And I went through, this was the traditional, what we used to tell people, two to three tablespoons to the body, a teaspoon to the face, or a shot glass in the summer months because for somehow that was more appealing. But um, even I told you how much people are saying you actually need to get the um, amount that sunscreens are tested for. So there's actually a, a certain amount that they're tested for on the skin to make the SPF and almost nobody uses it. You want to try to apply them to dry skin before sun exposure. It can be at the same time. So we don't tell people to not use it because you're out in the sun. You should have tried it 15 minutes ago. You want to get it on. It's important to note, again, reapply after swimming or heavy sweating. Heat degrades sunscreen ingredients, so leaving it in the car is not a great idea. Sitting on the beach, it might happen, but um, you have to be careful with that. And also, they do expire, so throw them out after about every two years. There's an expiration date on them. Common sense is key. And I just want to mention the Consumer Report sunscreen testing. I haven't accessed the 2014 data yet. It usually comes out, I think, in the fall, but I might be wrong. But last year, they work to test sunscreens for broad spectrum activity, water resistance, and staining of clothes. They don't test these to the same photochemical, photobiology standards that they use um, in, the, in the FDA. But what they found is that most products offered a good UVB protection. Many help block UVA. Um, but only half of the sunscreens did well enough to earn their recommendation. And they did find in the last year a bigger gap between what products claimed their SPF values were and the measured SPF values in the past. And so for this reason, the Consumer Reports was saying, put on SPF of 40 so you get enough. 
but it, it's important to note that the cheapest sunscreens almost always, always outscore the most expensive ones. So price has nothing to do with performance, and we tell patients to buy what they like, buy the vehicle you like, whether it's a lotion or a gel, a sport gel for the scalp, a lot of people don't like the greasiness. Um, they have sticks that some people like. They don't run into the eyes. Get a lip balm with sunscreen in it. And then sprays. And I just want to mention about sprays. The FDA is taking a look at the safety of sprays, not because of their sunscreen use, but because people tend to spray them like this and inhale the aerosol. So if you ever see somebody spraying their face, tell them to stop. Spray your hand, especially a kid. Spray, spray your hand and put it on your face. I don't like the sprays for the face. I just I tend to use a lotion on the face. And sprays are great, though. You see, they are, they are the most common uh, formulation of sunscreen now that's, that's sold as sprays, and it's for ease of application. The problem, though, is they do have to be rubbed in. If you just spray and walk away, you'll get that line of where the sun protection is. And a friend of mine has a great picture I have to get where his son did this and has the lines all over where he sprayed. So you got to rub it in. OK. Future directions, I think, are promising. And the main one is this. We've got to get these better absorbers that are the filters that are in uh, approved in Europe, Japan, and other countries into the US. And hopefully, this will be happening in the next year. So a lot of pressure from advocacy groups to really get the bisoctrazole, bimotrazole, these are the Tynosaur products, in, and um, that'll happen, I hope, soon. Uh, it has been looked at whether we can use almost a nutraceutical approach and add antioxidants to sunscreens and or take them uh, by, by, yeah, by mouth and in systemic form to help supplement skin repair and um, photoprotection practices. But a lot of these haven't quite panned out yet. I think it's a technology down the line. Um, in addition, there's some wash-on sunscreen that's been looked at in soaps. I don't know if anybody has seen or heard of RIT, R-I-T, over the counter. It's, it was terribly marketed. So it came out to help give an ultraviolet protection factor to clothes, and it's supposed to, you just throw it in your wash, and it's supposed to give the clothing a little bit of protection. RIT sounds like RID, which is a treatment we use to treat for lice, and so I think that's part of it, RIT. And, and so nobody uses it. And in addition, clothes themselves are a pretty good barrier. So I'm not sure it's giving you that much, you know, over your daily clothes. If you have rash guard and things have nice UPFs. Um, systemic photoprotective agents, this is some newer things down the pipeline. So polypodium is actually, I actually Googled this um, before I went on a trip to see if I could try it, because it's, it's a natural fern leaf extract and it has anti-inflammatory, antioxidant properties. It's been looked at in a pill form to help prevent individuals who are sensitive to the sun from getting a kind of reaction we call polymorphous light eruption. Um, I get that when I travel, and we were recently on a boat, and I tried to get it, but it's in, it's in New Zealand, and it's hard to get. So more to come, but I think it's kind of interesting. It looks natural, it looks safe, and maybe it could be helpful in preventing uh, sun damage. Now, alpha melanotide um, is actually very interesting. This is an amino, alkyl, al amino acid analog of alpha MSH. That's the melanocyte stimulating hormone, and it induces melanin formation in the skin. So it's actually doing what your melanocytes do. We don't want to have a tan, an artificial light, increase your melanin production, because that's that damage that the tan that the sun is doing to your skin. But what if you took a pill and you could just increase melanin formation? Well, that might be very safe. So this has actually been looked at, though, in a subcutaneous form. It's injected. It's, it's not on the horizon. Apparently, there's an over-the-counter one that's targeted for weight loss and tanning. Not safe. Don't use it. But an interesting concept people have talked about for a while. Basically, let's stimulate your pigment cells to produce more pigment to protect you from the sun. Carotenoids, I mentioned already, um, some of the things we see for antioxidants, polyphenols, green tea, chocolates. Again, yeah, eating chocolate's not going to prevent sunburn. But um, you know, there are, there are, there's hope that newer things are being looked at to supplement what we're doing now with sunscreens. Non-steroidal anti-inflammatory agents, which include the common anti-inflammatories like ibuprofen and aspirin, we're actually studying these for skin cancer prevention, including melanoma. Um, but, and again, they can help treat sunburn, but they also can make people sensitive to the sun, so we're not recommending you go out there and take these to prevent sunburn, and then other antioxidants. So this is a beach scene from the early 1990s. I like to conclude with this because there is no way we're going to revert back to this. It looks so hot and uncomfortable. <laughs> This is a good start, though. This is a picture from the Desert Museum in Tucson, uh, Arizona. And I was so pleased, this is already now a couple years ago, to go in there and see this generic brand sunscreen, SPF 30, right next to the soap dispenser in the women's bathroom. So I sent my husband in to look in the men's bathroom, and I said, is it in there? He goes, yeah. I go, is it full? And he shook it, and he goes, yeah. So. <laughs> 
So that's part of our sun protective. So I think that's my last slide, and I'm happy to answer questions. I didn't talk a lot about melanoma treatment. I'm happy to field those questions, but lots of excitement on the horizon for melanoma. Thank you. Uh, I have a question about the product that I'm using. It's a Neutrogena uh, mm -hmm. sunscreen. Yeah. And I put it on, and I notice that I've got it on my palms, and I've got this greasy feeling, and I wash it off under the faucet, in the bathroom. And so I'm wondering, uh, is this a sign that it's not quite as effective uh, against my perspiration as uh, it should be, if it so, washes off so easily? Because yeah. at the end of the day, when I take my shower after I've been playing baseball, it's behind my ears and it's really thick there, yeah. and, and it really takes some effort to wash it off in the shower. So I'm a little confused. Yeah, so, so you, you, know, you can easily wash sunscreens off with soap, right? So, so um, and the, the water, you have to look and see whether it's water resistant or very water resistant. And then Neutrogena just put out a beach defense one, and I did take that on the trip, and my kids felt that it was much better than their um, traditional ultra dry, cool touch one to really stay on the skin. Some of the sticks, which have a little more of a wax to them, stay on the skin. Um, and, you know, and again, but it, it's um, tried different formulations. They must have at least 20 different brands of Neutrogena sunscreen. So we just tell people, you know, find one that you like and, and switch around a little bit. Coppertone Sport and Banana Boat also got rated very highly. Um, Banana Boat? Coppertone Sport and, and, and the Sport ones by Banana Boat and Coppertone got rated very highly in that last consumer reports okay. for, um, for the water um, resistance. One other related question is, after I've been out in the sun for a while playing ball or whatever, my, my eyes burn. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if it's something in the sunscreen that's vaporizing, yeah. that's getting into my eyes that I should be cautious of. You know, the sunscreens get into the eyes, and we see this a lot in athletes. In fact, we're trying to target sun protection in um, Stanford athletes to start and in middle school, high school athletes who are more recalcitrant to sun protection messages because they spend, you know, four hours a day for 10 months a year outside. So it's a real problem. Sunscreens get in the eye and they do burn. The, the waxy formulations tend not to, if you ever used a stick. Um, for a while, the sticks did not have the avabenzone and octocrylene in them, and even the lip balms, most of them don't. I've only found one brand in Blistex that very few have both the, again, that long range UV um, A protection in them. But the sticks might be an option if you're gonna be out and sweating, because they just, they. And if you don't break out, they make teenagers break out, so. One other quick question. I notice as my hair thins, mm -hmm. uh, I thought my hair was protective of my scalp, but I'm seeing what yeah. looks like sun damage. Does the scalp get damaged through the hair on your head? If the hair is thin, thin it is? yes, it does. It, it, we do see um, melanomas and, and other skin cancers and those precancers on the scalp, and so the thinner your hair is, um, the more likely that can happen. So sunscreen gels, they used to make a nice sunscreen spray, spray for the scalp, but it hasn't, um, I didn't see it recently. I like to go on the counter and see, but definitely use some gels in the scalp. Okay, go ahead. Now I'm alive. You can go to a sports goods store, get an overshirt that says it's SPF 30, 50. Is it really any better than another tight weave shirt or am I being marketed to? So that's a really good question. So the, the clothing has an ultraviolet protection factor, not an SPF, and it's a UPF, and most of them have to be a uh, UPF of 50. And um, I had the pleasure of serving on a sunscreen committee for our American Academy of Dermatology, so looked at the Australian guidelines, which are really the pioneering guidelines for protective clothing, hats, eyewear, umbrellas, and what they rate is umbrellas that are, you know, feet longer than ours, and the broad brim hats are, you know, foot or tube, they're huge, really different clothes. So um, the clothes that have been marketed for that are, are tested for it, and I really like them for the outdoor sports and athletes because it, getting kids to put sunscreen on, if you can get a shirt on a kid then, and it's UPF 50, then focus on the, the face and the areas that are the feet and the hands that aren't covered. So they do a good job, but if you're wearing a tight weave cotton shirt, that's gonna do a good job. A thin white t-shirt will, if it's wet in particular, gives you virtually no SPF. So the thinner the weave, the lighter the color, is, is a lower protection, but clothing is a very good way to protect the skin. And now I'm pleased that um, the sun protective clothing we used to recommend by companies called um, Salumbra and Sun Precautions is now available at REI and it's come down in price because they make very breathable sun protective clothing that you can run and hike in and you know, it, but it's, it was very expensive and the prices are coming down. Clothing is a good thing. It's an adjunct and you know, again, don't rely on sunscreen alone. You want to use the clothing. 
Pardon me? Umbrella, umbrella any, um, anything's better than nothing. So a regular umbrella is okay. It's gonna give you some shade, that's okay. But you get about 50% of your UVA in the shade, so I still recommend that you're using sunscreen and other protection. Um, Kaiser dermatologists also recommend avoiding the sun from 10 to 4, and I swim regularly. So it seems to me the, the window should depend on the season, winter or summer. So wouldn't it make sense to say whatever, two hours after sunrise to an hour before sunset? Rather be, I mean, because when sun sets at 8.30 p.m. versus 5 p.m., then the 4 p.m., so, so I try to apply this myself when I swim. Right, and remember your UVA is constant year long regard, and day long, so it doesn't affect that, it's not affected by the time of day. The peak UVB is between 10 and four in general, and that's why the ranges, and it just depends on the sun overhead. You're right, there is some seasonal variation. The intensity is going to be a lot more in the summer than winter. So planning around that is absolutely fine before sunset or, or after sunrise is fine. For the UPF um, 50 clothes, usually you have to wash in a specific way. And uh, um, if you didn't do that, would that still help you or so it's just it, a fake away? You know, I'm not sure. I haven't looked at the data on how washing affects it because it's a tight weave. And so unless you're washing it with bleach where you're wearing the fabric down, you know, I, I think you're probably fine to wash it. I, I would tend not to put it in the dryer, though, because a lot of these are the more stretchy materials. So you might affect the weave. Yeah. Talking about the, the way that the weave is affected by, in UPF clothing by the, by the sun protection, or by the um, soaps in the detergent, yeah. I, I don't have an answer for that one, but um, hopefully these will get a little bit better. Quick comment, then a couple of questions. A friend of mine's grandson went to elementary school in Australia for a couple of years, and they had sunscreen in every classroom he was in. The kids were required to wear hats that were, had long flaps on them on the side on the playground. They had covered areas on the playgrounds, et cetera. We, we are way behind. I mm -hmm. taught for quite a while at a school that um, refused to let kids wear hats right. because it wasn't part of the uniform. <laughs> but um, my question, I, I have tried so many sunscreens, and I have yet to find one that I can put on and not feel like I need an immediate shower afterwards and for the entire time I'm wearing it. Um, you know, <laughs> any recommendations from anybody? I mean, I use so, Olay uh, pretty much now and um, a couple from, you know, the health food store that yeah. aren't as bad. Yeah. So um, the Tynosorb product in, in uh, Canada, the Anthelios products contain Tynosorb. And they're about $26 a bottle. They have one that's called Extreme Fluid. It's, these are made by La roche Posay, so it's French. And it's like water. It's so liquidy. In fact, my kids don't like it because it's like water, but no one notices it when it's on. They also have one that's a melt-in cream that's the very water resistant that I thought was terrific. So Extreme so Fluid. So look for Anthelios. Okay. Just Google Tynosorb containing products. Okay. You'll come up with Amazon, and Amazon okay. will take... I mean, so the same thing we talked about on the slides, Tynosorb, T-I-N-O-S-O-R-B. So I think I probably said that I have no interest in this company, but it's not even a company. That's the trade name of the ingredients that I mentioned. But um, if you Google T-I-N-O-S-O-R-B, Tynosorb. So if you Google Tynosorb containing products, um, the first thing that will pop up now is, is, um, is uh, Anthelios, and it's probably out of Canada because it's not approved in the U.S., and it, the, you can get it from a Canadian pharmacy, and we tell patients how to get this if they're really interested in it. Um, again, in the next year, the hope is that that will be incorporated into U.S. sunscreens because it's so much, it's such a much better product. Okay. And then my last question is, um, I'd like you to talk a little bit about any um, studies available for people who are who may be at high risk for melanoma and or when genetic testing is recommended. Right. I mean, my dad died of melanoma, yeah. so I know I'm at a higher sure. risk, so even though the skin tone is yeah. in the three to four range. So, so that's an entirely different topic, but um, when we talk about genetic testing for melanoma, there's only one test that's commercially available called the P16 test, and we've developed specific guidelines to recommend it. Excuse me, and those 
include having um, three family members with melanoma, having three melanomas that are invasive yourself, or having both pancreatic cancer and melanoma. Other than that, we don't recommend genetic testing. There are genetic mutation tests now that we're doing on melanoma tumors themselves. Those are called somatic mutations. They're not hereditable, but it's the things that go wrong in a tumor that makes it become a cancer and makes it evade treatment. And now we have targeted therapies that work against these specific mutated tumors. And so, again, I didn't talk about melanoma treatment, but the field has changed so dramatically in the last five years with targeted therapies and then immunotherapies that boost one's immune system to really fight cancer cells. So it's a very hopeful field um, in terms of advanced treatment. And again, my goal is to not let patients get to the advanced stage to really detect them when they're early or to prevent it at the outset. Um, I was just wondering, um, as far as uh, the daily routine, um, how, um, what is the SPF uh, that you recommend 15, 30? Yeah, that's a good question. You know, as far yeah. as... So it depends on what you're doing. So if you're going to go to work, I mean, I, I try to you know, just have a daily um, SPF 15 sunscreen that's light and put it on my face. It's my moisturizer, and I go out. And if I'm going to be uh, at a swim meet or one of my kids' events, then I'm going to use something that's a lot stronger with more SPF. So a 15 is still... So. A 15 is still considered an okay daily? 15 is fine daily. Just you remember like that you're probably not getting 15. So when the right. studies have been done, it's about you're getting about 30% of what the SPF is because you're not going to put on a teaspoon. To, try putting a teaspoon on your face and then say, well, I'm probably putting on at least maybe less than half of that. So, you know, that's, that's the problem. So, you know, again, I think SPF 15 is fine if you're walking to and from your car, going to and from your office mm -hmm. and whatnot. Mm -hmm. But if you're going to be outside playing tennis or something, right. put something stronger on, wear the hat and wear the sunglasses. Too. So it's about lifestyle and... It's about, um, it's about activities. Because, it's about time of day, which was brought yeah, up very well. My, my life has changed so that... Um, I'm coaching now. Yeah. Oh, sorry. So I'm coaching now, and um, I've been inside a lot, but now, you know, so I would just put a 15 on, but then I have to be outside with, you know, young girls for three hours a day during a season, and then, so, so you just ramp it up during ramp that Ramp it up, time. bring more, and I'll tell you, we're, we're, as we're targeting the athletes, we're finding that the the coach's behaviors and instruction on sun protection is more influential by far than the parents. And so we're actually, we've got a whole program called Sun Sport at Stanford where we're really learning the research, what's gonna change behaviors and coaches advocating for sun protective behaviors can make a big difference and having the sunscreen there. You know, if you can if afford to have a big generic sunscreen, it's again, better than nothing. Um, is there any research on um, the, the condition of skin cancer, any form of that uh, that can be reversible without any surgical uh, intervention? So is um, reversible? Yeah, meaning like uh, you don't really have to do the surgery. Sur yeah. surgery and so I, I alluded to a couple of um, the creams that we use, topical agents that can be used to treat superficial skin cancers. One of them is called 5-fluorouracil. One is called imiquimod. Um, we uh, have used those in basal cells and squamous cell carcinomas that are very superficial. They're FDA approved for that. Deeper skin cancers generally require surgery. And we've also used the amiquimod um, for a superficial type of melanoma, again, just involving that top layer of the skin, although it's not FDA approved for that. There's been a wealth of data to show it's very effective. And that can be uh, very useful for individuals who are poor surgical candidates, who are older, can't tolerate surgery, have a lot of medical conditions. But some of the deeper skin cancers, you're really going to have to go for surgery. And melanoma is a surgically treated cancer. So that's generally our first step. Quick question about education on, on all this. Hmm? No. Are, are, is, besides just how to protect yourself, is there education going on about like the, the status symbol of like getting a suntan and over doing yourself, like, especially for areas that aren't California where the suntan is still yes, that we're talking status. About the social behaviors that yeah, come tan. Yeah, like so, I've never yeah. seen more tan people than yeah, winter so, in Stockholm. You know, it's, it's really tough because I work with a lot of colleagues in um, the behavioral realm and in public health and cancer control. 
and um, messaging to young women in particular to try to convince them that having fairer, paler, paler skin is acceptable is very difficult to um, promote. And so it, it's, um, that's why we're saying, well, fine, then use the sunless tanners, those ones that stain the skin. It's very difficult to change those behaviors. And if you open up any magazine, everybody's in a, a string bikini and this and that, and their skin is dark, and they've gone to the tanning salon. And so um, it's, it's a tough challenge. Um, we've even done work to find or to show that individuals who use the sunless tanners are still more likely to seek the tan and get the tanning bed. And so it's, it's really a tough behavior. And one of my colleagues at Harvard has also done work, as have others, to suggest that tanning behaviors are addictive, that they actually release opiates in the blood, and people are addicted to that sensation of the heat on the skin and the color. And so we're battling a lot of things. Um, one thing that the US Preventive Services Task Force did recommend, remember I said they don't at this point say to do skin screening in the general population. They're not saying don't do it in high risk groups and folks with skin cancer. But one thing that they do recommend is that our prevention messages haven't been very well received in younger individuals and that we should focus on what the sun does to make you look older. So start really getting messaging out that shows they had, the American Academy of had a great ad of a woman with a split face and they you know, dramatically photo aged her at 20 and 80 or 60. And you know, really harsh messages can make a big difference in younger folks. So, and that I think with social media messaging and what we're doing, it, it's a tough issue. To, and, and so yes, the work is being done on how do you reach various populations. And in fact, we're going to embark on, we hope, with funding a study that looks at um, melanoma rates in California in individuals between 15 and 39. So we call this the adolescent and young adult group, and look at the behaviors that, that, that's folk, that were around their melanoma diagnosis, and then try to see who has thick disease and who has thin disease and who did a better job, and then how do you market into that to make sure you can get a message that's acceptable, it's reproducible, and so on, effective. Great point, though. Um, I have a question. Thank you. Um, I, I don't use sunscreen because so far I haven't found one that doesn't end up causing me to break out. Mm -hmm. So I, I wasn't sure which component that I should look for in sunscreens to avoid. That's a great point. So, so the sunscreens that don't make you break out are actually next to the acne products because they'll say non-acneogenic or non-comedogenic. A comedo is a whitehead or a blackhead. So um, Neutrogena, oil of Olay, um, purpose, uh, all you know, actually, um, copper tone oil free. If they say won't clog pores, uh, won't cause acne, won't make acne worse, they've generally been tested for that, and a lot of them will even say for the face, you know, so copper tone face. Um, so that those can all be look for one that's marketed for the face because they, like I said, these heavier ones, the waxy ones, if you put a lot on, can really clog, you know, make the um, acne worse. So um, look for one that's marketed for the face that says non-acne causing, non-acneogenic, and that should help. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, uh, which brand or ingredients have probably the least allergic reaction for kids? Um, you know, I, I've, I've never seen sunscreen reactions in general. The, these are really non-allergenic. I, I know I said that the benzophenone was named the contact allergen of the year, but this drug, this you know, the UV filter has been around since the 70s, and you know, kids really don't get sun reactions to these. They, 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 kids don't put them on. The parents are putting them on. Very, very uncommon to have any of the available sunscreens cause reactions in kids. So, so I, I really um, think that they are safe. What's in the U.S. Again, they're, hopefully they're going to get better. If a person has a reaction to sunscreen, they can either. Sometimes it's to the vehicle and not to the pro the ingredients. Sometimes they're reacting to propylene glycol, which is something that makes a, a liquid more liquidy or a lotion more liquidy. So you might want to switch brands, switch types, move from a lotion to a stick or something like that, um, or to a spray. But um, most of them don't really cause a lot of reactions in my experience. And we go through gobs of sunscreen in our dermatology world. If a person has a reaction, we recommend then using those inorganic physical sunscreens. Again, they will have some chemicals put into them because by themselves they're not effective. To have the zinc oxide be totally effective, it has to have a 25% concentration, which means it's pure white, so that no one's gonna use that. So. I'd, I'd like to suggest that 
maybe you consult with someone in the history department. Pardon me? I'd suggest you consult with someone in the history department. The generation that raised me, and I'm no longer a young person, um, grew up on the farm in central Illinois. Yeah. And the women, when they went into the field to pick corn, wore a sunbonnet that kept the sun off their face. They, they were completely wrapped up in clothes like those people like the on picture. the beach in 1900. Yeah. And the, there was a market that sold that. Yeah. And you've got to talk to the people how that was sold at the turn of the century, 18th to 19th, or 19th to 20th century, and and yeah. and regenerate that same that same market. Again, it's an it's uphill, there. uphill the, battle. The techniques so are there. A lot of um, people have uh, attributed Coco Chanel in the 20s to really changing fashion mores and women's dress and shortening things up and sleeves coming in and hem lines coming up, the formation of the bikini and I don't know what year, but you know probably the 40s or 50s over whole piece suits. And so a lot of this is, you know, you can go back to all the history you want, but how do you change behavior when what's, what girls are bombarded with are fewer clothes rather than more? And I have two teenage daughters, and my husband says, you are not going out in that today. <laughs> and he's worried about the way they look, and I'm worried about the sun. So, you know, it's, um, I get you, I get it, but it's really hard. And so changing those behaviors is difficult, and, and you've got to get an industry behind it, and it's a cultural shift. But that's why we've seen skin cancer rates rise so dramatically. Is the, in, in women, we've got this extra issue of the tanning beds, we believe, over the last 30 to 40 years. Hi. In terms of protection, you say if we stay in the shade, we still get 50% of the, okay. And um, what about, say, um, is the umbrella, but treat, like the shade under the umbrella, the shade under the tree, or the yeah. shade in the hallway, that's the yeah. same thing. That's shade the first, is, and yeah. That's the first part. The second part is the windows. For example, when we're driving, yeah. Does the car windows protect us in yeah. any way? And sure. the opaque uh, of the, the window, okay. another kind of thing. Could, could you please yeah. clarify let me, that? Let me, let me comment on that. So windows that are tinted are better in terms of their ultraviolet protection than windows that aren't. Windows block most UVB, but they let UVA through. Laminated windows that are in your uh, windshield actually block 100%. They're really good. But your side windows and top windows aren't laminated. Tinted is better than not. So we do see more skin cancers in drivers on the driver's side and in passengers on the passenger side. We see more skin cancers in pilots who are at altitude and ionizing radiation issues. But skin cancers on the left side in a driver from the window, from the hand outside, are much more common. So windows is an issue. Um, I'm hoping that that cars are, if, if they were to laminate the side and top windows, they you know, get your sunroof, which I never have mine open, but it's, um, you know, that's a big problem because the sun's coming right through. Um, your other question was on the shade. Yeah, so, so shade, shade structures are good, so I didn't mean to, you do get some inherent uh, reflection of light if you're in concrete or beach under an umbrella, and UVA, again, is just so ubiquitous that you tend to get a, some exposure but um, shade is good. It's good to seek the shade and get out of the sun. You're not getting the direct sun. You know, and again, the products that have been tested with a UPF are gonna have some rating as opposed to your typical rain umbrella, but that's certainly better than nothing. So you know, I was down in Morgan Hill at a soccer tournament and all of us were underneath the, the shade structure, which was flimsy, and someone else had an umbrella under over. I was like, I wish I had an umbrella because it was so sunny. So it, it's fine, you know, use what you can to get out of the sun when it's super hot like that, and definitely hats and visors and so on. One more question, anybody? Okay, for our next cafe side, July 22nd, we're gonna have Dr. Uh, Jennifer Brokaw speak on improving the doctor-patient relationship with advanced care planning. And I'd just like to thank Dr. Sweater for a marvelous talk tonight. Thank, thank you. you very much. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.